This is a reading from The Witch's Ointment, The Secret History of Psychedelic Magic by Thomas Hatzis. I'm reading on page 216, Romantic Conjecture. It can be argued that a fourth stage in the development of the concept of the witch's ointment occurred not in early modern times, but just a few decades ago in our own time. This is the romantic view in its most extreme form. It holds that women and men smeared brooms with hallucinogenic ointments that were then inserted into the vagina or rectum to induce trance, thereby carrying on a ritual that existed since antiquity. While certain aspects of this theory have a historical foundation, i.e. anointing one's vagina with a hallucinogenic drug to induce trance, quote, fly, quote, transform, or experience some other kind of psyche magic, the overall idea that people rubbed drugs on broom handles and masturbated with them appears nowhere in the early modern period records. Not a single word of this manner of introducing the ointments into the body, i.e. via some kind of broomstick dildo, was recorded until 1973 with the author Michael Harrison's The Roots of Witchcraft. Harrison offers speculation but zero evidence for this claim. Anthropologist Michael Harner repeats this faux pas in his essay the Role of Hallucinogenic Plants in European Witchcraft, dated that same year. I contend that until the early 17th century, the use of these ointments for some kind of spirit flight was fairly unknown by the larger European population. Some learned magicians notwithstanding, who might have been in contact with everyday magic but certainly didn't understand the deeper art of arts of beneficia, which is the art of poison. They, of course, used these ointments and po po <laughs> they, of course, used these potions and ointments vended to them by women like Marauchi in at least four ways: recreationally as love filters, mercenarily as a way to bewitch a pesky neighbor or abusive spouse, passionately to enchant an unrequited lover, or medically, as a cure for everything from insomnia to indigestion. These beneficia, beneficia sold their love filters to their clients while using similar drug mixtures on themselves, but with the addition of incantations and thus a different mindset, thereby stimulating a different, perhaps visionary, experience. When early modern period ecclesiastics started to pay attention to localized forms of drug-inspired magical experiences, they looked to ancient literature and saw love potions containing the remains of dead children in horses, epodes, and Pamphile's transformation ointment in Apulu Apulius's metamorphosis, that is, the golden ass. As outlined in chapter 4, there was in reality a variety of readily available hallucinogens and soporific plants that were probably in use rather than the imagined infant corpses. The rich historical tradition of eating child's flesh could only have pushed its association with the witch's ointment into a stronger relationship. What's more, we have reason to believe that sometimes people really did seek out the flesh of dead infants for their magical efficacies. And yet, our earliest and best accounts of these ointments, from the time immediately prior to the formulation of the witch stereotype, i.e., Johannes Neider, Alonzo Tostado's Genesis Commentary, and Abraham of Worms, make no such heinous connection. The ointment context in these writers' works had everything to do with folk religion and magic, nothing at all to do with the insurgent cults 
of devil-worshipping witches. Even Bernardino of Siena, who preached against the practice of infanticide for magical purposes in his sermons, did not associate Finicella's cat transformation ointment with child murder, a point he would not have hesitated, hesitated to make if he truly believed it. Why bring up the ointment in the first place? As for the transformation ointments in ancient literature, Pamphile's transformation into an owl and Apuleius's metamorphosis, discussed in chapter 2, has recently been used to serve as a literary origin for the witch's ointment in lieu of folk, a folk foundation. I believe this is true, but only to a certain extent. The early modern period flying ointments weren't the product of ancient fiction, although ancient fiction certainly directed the ecclesiastic's interpretation of them. A drug potion, powder, or ointment that allowed a person to shapeshift into an insect or animal might have, been, might have reminded a literary cleric of Pamphile's transformation. That doesn't mean that the ointments and their use for psychomagical experiences didn't exist. Guillaume Bartista de la Porta, who knowingly dosed his mates with a drug so as to watch them shapeshift, makes no mention of Apuleius's comedy after all. As demonstrated in Chapter 4, Solonece family plants, those are like nightshade have a seemingly timeless association with magic, witchcraft, and medicine. Apuleius's ancient comedy, comedy might have shaped the ecclesiastical interpretation of the ointment in the modern, early modern period, but it certainly did not create them. The history of the witch's ointment begins not with an unbroken link stretching back to an ancient witch cult that rubbed hallucinogenic oils on brooms and inserted them in available orif human orifices, but over a development in theological and physiological debate that occurred during the early modern period regarding nocturnal flight. This debate disseminated the knowledge of these plants, while it also, and perhaps more importantly, popularized the association of Solonece family plants with transcendent, transcendent magical experiences. This then entered the historical record in earnest around the late 16th century. And while there wasn't really a witch's ointment, there was a variety of mystifying mixtures made from myriad means that involved psyche magical visionary experiences the true breadth and nature of which remain unknown today. Before the formulation of the Convention of the Witches' Ointment, which began in the early 1400s, those who knew of and used these substances can only be described as a scattered minority, so few that they are impossible to fully track historically. In some cases, it seems these psychoactive drugs may have been a way to lull oneself into a twilight sleep, allowing one to walk freely and lucidly about the dreamscape. Within the larger theological debate, the otherworldly state of mind caused by the ointments, that state beyond the veil, served as a way for the so-called witches to fly to the devil, quote, in spirit, unquote, instead of corporally corporally. So while skeptics like Norman Cohn and Richard Kiekhefer are correct that the witch's ointment is the product of learned demonologists, they are wrong in asserting that psychomagical drug ointments didn't exist and weren't used for a variety of purposes, whether for visionary journeys or recreational escapes. Equally incorrect is the romantic notion that flying to meet and worship a horned god presents an unbroken link to ancient rites that were experienced as a result of masturbating with hallucinogenic ointment-covered brooms 
from which we get our modern notion of witches writing them. All evidence suggests that while some women might have inserted these drug ointments into their vaginas, it was not done so by way of a broomstick applicator, but more likely the fingers or a pessary. We can therefore in this study, knowing that both positions, that of the skeptic and that of the romantic, simply do not fly with or without magical ointments. <laughs>